Jesus, Jesus, and more Jesus. The call today is a little weak. Amen? It's a little uncertain. Mm. Things are uncertain in life. But one thing we know, Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. I was uh, reading the Bible and praying this morning. And uh, the book of Psalms, chapter 9, this is a, an event at August 14th, 2012. The Bowens came back to um, Santa Monica from Africa, and uh, the Bible says, The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. What a powerful promise David gives us. And I don't think we've been quite through the kind of terror that David went through when Saul was chasing him around, and his brothers, uh, his other fellow soldiers, uh, were the ones that weren't really the, the greatest. <laughs> they were the criminals sometimes and got saved, like many of us. And God's go governing the world. We don't have to worry about it. Can okay, you say any Amen. You know, we see things happening in the world, and we see people uh, doing things that are unjust and all kinds of uh, leadership problems, but God is going to judge the world, and we just need to do what he says. Amen? So one of the things he tells us to do is read the Bible. The words inside are true and reliable. And so let's read uh, Jeremiah chapter 47. 47 today. Amen. Amen. This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning the Philistines before Pharaoh attacked Gaza. Let me just say one thing about this when we, we, we read this. We're, we're hearing about Egypt, how uh, God uh, used Nebuchadnezzar to judge Egypt and in Israel because of the worship of foreign gods. Now he's going to go through some other uh, areas in the Middle East there today, uh, it wasn't called the Middle East then, but he's going through these other areas and seeing the judgment by his uh, instrument being uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who is definitely not one of uh, uh, the chosen ones. Um, and you watch what happens when God does. And I think that this is a pattern that when people have worship uh, idolatry, and worship the world in which we live, that uh, God does have his way, and, and he has his way, and his way is always right, righteous, a righteous God. So here we go in verse 2. This is what the Lord says. See how the waters are rising in the north? They will become an overflowing torrent. They will overflow the land and everything in it, the towns and those who live in them. The people will cry out, and all who dwell in the land will wail. Sometimes we feel like wailing. <laughs> at the sound of the hoofs of galloping steeds, at the noise of the internet of enemy chariots and the rumble of their <sighs> false news. Fathers will not turn to help their children. Probably one of the greatest impacts on God is the impact that fathers have made to their own children and how they raise them, how they forget them. Their hands will hang limp, for the day has come to destroy the Philistines, to cut off all survivors who could help Tyre and Sidon. 
The Lord is about to destroy the Philistines, the remnant of, from the coast of Kephor. Geza will shave her head in the morning. That means shame. Ascalon will be silenced. O remnant on the plain, how long will you cut yourself? Ah, sword of the Lord, you cry, how long, how long till you rest? Return to your scabbard, cease and be still. But how can it rest when the Lord has commanded it, when he has ordered it to attack Ascalon and the coast? And those are the cities of uh, the Philistines. I, I imagine that God uh, hasn't changed his mind, that uh, he does not like wickedness. He does not like lying and terror, uh, and, and especially, um, we read the scripture yesterday in Malachi, turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. This is one of the great, great uh, trials of our, our, our generation and the generation that has uh, sprung up in these latter days that the uh, fathers are nowhere. They, the men are not taking responsibility for children, and they'll walk out on their wives. They'll call for a, a, you know, a difficulty. But God is um, working in people, and God is uh, bringing to uh, to bear the idea, the the real t- truth of how much men are needed as fathers to their children, and. Uh, if not, probably the same thing's going to happen to uh, those that uh, do not do that, uh, do not uh, raise up their children and take responsibility for uh, the, pe- uh, the children. So let's pray today. We are they that take the city. Um, we're getting more and more of an uh, understanding of what it means to take the city. And we need to pray that God would give us strategies, uh, the strategy of his word. So let's pray. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, for the great opportunity we have in the generation in which we live, the joy that we have in coming before you and seeing your miracle-working power. God, let us be effective today. Let us be effective in the ways that we go about our business, God, go about uh, your business for our lives. God, we pray that you would lift up. I thank you for these that are here in this live stream these that make it uh, possible, uh, these leaders in our church. God, we pray for all that have uh, put their eyes on this uh, uh, live stream. We pray that, God, you would uh, convict our hearts, convict our minds. God, so that we might be those that take the city. God, what meaning that, uh, God, express uh, position, God, that you want to put us in a place where we can help the people in this city. To understand, hallelujah, their great blessing comes from you and your spirit and your church and your family. God, we also pray for our public servants, our police officers, our firemen, for those that are uh, medical in the medical field and uh, helping people that are sick and being into the situation that um, they are in today. We pray that God would bless them. We also pray for our president. We pray for uh, the coming up election, God, that the man that uh, you want to be in power, God will be in power. We pray that God, you uh, will judge the nations. Yes, God, we pray for mercy for our country, pray for mercy for the world, God, so that people that, are, that will be able to uh, receive you, God, and have uh, you in their lives, that, God, that they will cry out. There will be a great cry for you, God of salvation. We also pray for all of our pastors and our leaders. We thank you, God, for uh, what, what is going on. We pray for the memorial uh, coming up this weekend for Pastor Mitchell and, and Pastor Cluck. We pray that uh, the blessing of your hand would be upon it. We pray for all of those that are participating, God, the many thousands that will be there. God, to honor our fellowship, we thank you for the great blessing that we have been able to uh, participate in in planting churches around the world. Thank you, God, for Pastor Mitchell and all of those in his train of disciples, God, of which we are. We pray that your blessing would be upon our lives uh, and continue this uh, planting of churches. We also pray for those that are fighting fires throughout our country, God. Um, 
Now, we pray that uh, you would uh, help the uh, firefighters and uh, put these fires uh, to rest. We also pray for healing for all those uh, that have cancer and uh, on the list that we have. We pray just for a couple of them, especially this morning. I want to pray for Mike Melton. God, I pray that you'd give him a strength to uh, be able to overcome the powers of uh, the sickness uh, that was in his body, God. We pray that it had been all, it was all cleared out, uh, God, and that he would have many years, God, to uh, be helping us here in this church as well as his family and all of those uh, that he affects. We also pray for my brother, J Richard Scribner. We pray that, God, you would uh, help him to get the right medical treatment, God. Help him to cry out in your name name of Jesus. God, call upon it. God, let you, him uh, experience the wonderful blessing of healing that comes from your hand, as many as of us have already felt. God, we also pray for Norm Cutler. God, others uh, on our list. God, we uh, pray for Terry Donahue and Victoria Wilson. God, we pray their blessing. God, we pray for all of these. Uh, Mary Elena Austinheimer, Rick Pesido, Felipe uh, Gonzalez. Uh, God, we pray that uh, you would use, hallelujah, these prayers, God, hallelujah, to affect uh, those that have this cancer. We bind it in Jesus' name. We also ask for healing for Karen Straub, a former member of this church, uh, asking for uh, prayer for open heart surgery uh, on Thursday, uh, that coming up tomorrow. We thank you, God, for uh, Janet Meyer, God, Caitlin's mom. God, we pray she recover from her uh, procedures. Uh, we pray for Jacques Lazarus for uh, salvation, God, and for healing of his uh, uh, mind and soul and body, God, so that he might serve you for your kingdom to come, uh, Kurt. Uh, Platt, we also pray for God, for his blessing uh, upon him, God, that he would come away from this injury, God, and be made whole. Pray for Rosalind, God. Uh, we pray that for peace in her heart and mind. And Bobby Garrishay, a kidney transplant, recovering there. Mike Solomon, Ruthie Green, Bonnie McLyman, Betsy Slowen, uh, Teresa Paul Addison, the, the, uh, uh, the, the relative of... Um, uh, the Myers, God, we just pray this little sixth, sixth grader would uh, come out of that depression. We also pray, God, for Johnny Huerta and Harrison Summer. God, we pray for a Job-like uh, blessing to come on his life. Oh, God, hallelujah, both of them, hallelujah. Just get, give them, God, a victory, hallelujah. We pray for victory in their lives in the name of Jesus. We also um, pray for Sandy Tubin, God. We got in contact with her, God. Again, we pray your blessing for her life. I hope she's listening. Uh, we praying for her, God, and, uh, and her situation. Daniel Alonzo, Monica, Cheryl Torme, Randy Gashler, God. We pray for all of those that are working in their homes, God, for the kingdom of God to see your kingdom come and will be done. Also, salvation for Tracy and Joanna and Scott and Nancy. Uh, Mershon, Jalisa, Rosemary, Meg's father, Port the Portola family. We just pray for salvation there in all of those situations. And God, I thank you for the blessing, the praise report from Natalie as we prayed for her the last few days for her difficult circumstance. And she wrote back and said that uh, she had favorable results. And so, God, we thank you that uh, when we pray, hallelujah, God, you do the, you do the work. Amen. Very desperate was uh, Natalie in this situation. And uh, God, you worked it out all for good as far as her uh, testimony uh, just yesterday that I heard. We also pray for our new churches and the infant care and all of our schools. For Jim Stone there in hospice, God, we pray blessing for him, making a testimony for the people that are there. David Watts, uh, we pray for him. We, when we thank you for the blessing of all that uh, you've done in uh, our, our fellow uh, uh, former church member there in, um, up, uh, uh, in, in the fires, God, Jeanette and her husband, uh, thank you for helping them. And so today, God, we come, uh, we asking you for our country, God. We pray for, we pray for all the garbage that is uh, in the air, hallelujah, the airwaves. We pray that, God, we would come to be brotherly, have brotherly kindness, God, that out of the many, we can be one, e pluribus unum. And God, we pray for hope, hallelujah, for all those that are wandering around saying, what is going on? What's happening here? We pray, God, we could look to you for all our needs as you promise. 
And so today we say, good morning, Jesus. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light? For the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare and the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say can that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the saints. Brave. Hallelujah. So that's our singing. We didn't have a singer this morning, so we had to uh, improvise. Amen. So we're doing Lighthouse University, and we're having an exciting time. One of the, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, was so exciting for me when I really got involved in this uh, teaching way back, way, 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 way back in the 70s, was the, um, just the emphasis on what God has already shown throughout the ages. And I just read that psalm today, just, I, it just was a happenstance uh, in my prayer uh, to, to just give us the confidence that God has you and I in his, in his vision for America and for each one, each, each of us. Right, let me just, just say that one part, of the one part of the verse that says, for those who know your name, for those who know your name will trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. And so I want you to look at this um, Teaching, we ended uh, on page 109, uh, our self-governing republic. Uh, probably more so than anything else, uh, when we read this, uh, we're looking at uh, page 109. It says, our self-governing republic. Listen to what the first sentence is. There is increasing discussion today, even in Washington, of restoring our self-governing republic. You know when this was written? I've said it many times. You know when it's been written? The American Covenant? 1981. Who was president? Ronald Reagan. Increasing discussion today with Ronald Reagan. By the way, two years later, uh, I ran for Congress here in Santa Monica. After, uh, and of course, I was teaching out of this book. And uh, we, felt, we felt very con convicted. We went out on the streets and trying to uh, get elected <laughs> to uh, the House of Representatives. I'm laughing because it, was, uh, it really was something that I never really thought about being involved in, in the government. And the pastor that was here at the time, he said, well, you know, since you played football and that somebody knows your name, we're going to stick you out there. <laughs> And we had Pastor Summer ran for the, um, uh, school, at the school board here in Santa Monica. We lost everything. Uh, we never won anything. Uh, uh, the only thing we won was against the other Republican. And, uh, and, and I ended up being the uh, vice president of the Republican Party in, in uh, California here in Los Angeles. And uh, did uh, love that? Uh, I, I don't think so. Harrison was the only one, and he was the highest. I don't know. Did uh, did Chuck Lumsden be on the? Uh, was did he win? I I don't think so. I think Harrison got the most votes of anybody. But uh, Harrison got the most votes, but we didn't ever have anybody on the uh, school board, never. As, as my knowledge. And so we, we, came, we came close, but we didn't, uh, we didn't really actually get one. But we can check into that, okay? Do that for me, Glenn. I pray, I, <laughs> thank you. I could be wrong. It's happened before. Just ask my wife. Um, 
But when we looked at, when we're reading this today, just think about it, 1981. We're talking about 39 years, aren't we? 39 years ago. And it is more depraved today in ret retrospect to the teaching. Where it's more depraved today, and I'm not talking about depraved today in the world, but in the church. We are less involved, uh, way more less involved than we, we were in this church and the church in general uh, in restoring the self-governing republic. Uh, one of the uh, caveats that I would put in there is this. Four years ago, when we were about to elect a president um, after uh, Obama had been president, and uh, Hillary Clinton was running because she was the vice president at the time. And the, the country looked like it just was about ready to fall apart as far as Christianity was concerned. I mean, literally, falling apart. I mean, there's no Christian emphasis at all. I mean, it's, it's gone really into the other direction of having other religions and everything, and we're being kicked out more and more. But this crazy guy uh, by the name of... Uh, <clears throat> Donald Trump came into the, the one reason why I thought, um, I mean, at the beginning, I didn't think, think very much that he would be even have a chance, you know. It's like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, or something like that. I mean, you know, who, who thinks Donald Trump's going to be able to win the presidency? It was crazy, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, all these other real uh, kind of conservative candidates, uh, I'm not going to mention all their names, but... Uh, they were kind of thinking like this is a, an anomaly, it's not going to happen. But the one thing that changed everything in my mind was what he was doing in his campaign. Because I remember campaigning, and uh, the first thing that I, I saw that really made me think, you know something, this might be God's man for the hour. And that was the vice presidential um, uh, debate between uh, Pence and the other guy. <laughs> the other guy was a nut. But uh, Pence stood up there and he said, I'm a born-again Christian, and I do not believe in abortion, and I never will believe in abortion. And he was so powerful in his testimony. And for me, I mean, the major issue, and for this church, and for I think all Christians, the major, major issue of uh, all political uh, world is just the one, life. We haven't got that. We haven't got that settled yet. You know, we go, that's what got us into it. We were uh, 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 picketing abortion clinics and uh, saying you can't uh, kill people. You know, and that was basically what Pence said. So I'm looking at Trump, and then he's, all, he's putting all these Christians in his cabinet and in, in his campaign. Christian, Christian, DeVos, you know, and, and uh, uh, all of the others. There are so many, I don't want to go through them. But um, the uh, atmosphere was Christian, saying this is, this is they're Christians. They're going to be in his cabinet if he gets elected. And... Albeit, we now know that he did get elected. But let me speak to the issue of today, our self-governing republic. In 1981, it says in, there's an increasing discussion there in Washington of restoring our self-governing republic. Listen to what Marshall says. The only possible way for such rhetoric to become reality is if the critical path we have just discussed is followed. Well, what's the critical path? It's basically, we're going to have to put God first, meaning that the church is going to have to become, again, a vital part of the government of the United States of America. And the church is specifically the family first. That's the first church, is the family. The family, the self-governing family. So watch what he says here. We have left discussion of civil government to the end, not because it is the least important area of our lives, but to emphasize the basic structure of government will not conform to its original constitutional model until people become self-governing in their homes, their churches, 
their schools, and their businesses. What percentage of the uh, uh, United States of America have followed that particular model? In your what? Home is home the church. What percentage of even Christians make their home a church or make their home a place to where children and people are uh, sons and daughters and parents are raised up with biblical standards? What percentage do you think? I mean, just guess. I mean, I would say it's less than 10%. And I would look at our own church and ask, what percent of our church are our homes? And is the church so prominent in your life that it could rule the actual government of our country? I remember, though, when I first came to this church, we had a pile of uh, television sets. And we put them out there in the, uh, in the parking lot. I'm pointing to the parking lot right now. And we, we stacked them all up, and we take baseball bats and beat them. Destroyed our television sets. And uh, those television sets didn't go on. And I haven't had a television set since then, that, uh, except for the fact that now it's a whole different ball game with the, uh, I have a television set right here on my watch. <laughs> I mean, you can, do, you can do anything, you know, nowadays. And, and so it's, it, they, the devil has made it uh, very... Uh, well, it's not the devil. It's just Christians not uh, being Christians. So this is what his strategy is. You have to have a Christian home, to have a Christian church, to have Christian schools, and have Christian businesses. And that's a strategy. And so I'm, 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 I am, so to speak, in that feeling or thinking that we're bankrupt. We don't have that. It's not there. And so, you know... Back in 1981, Ronald Reagan was about ready to get that all going, but it didn't really uh, materialize completely. So I put a little star by, I, I want you to underline the, the structure where it says in here on your page, because I, I, I rewrote it again uh, yesterday and today. Uh, this part where we say, where it says that the, Christ, the, constitution, the original constitutional model is that we have self-governing homes, churches, schools, and businesses. Now, this is Marshall Foster talking, but I do believe it's in an inspiration of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, that we could read. Remember, we talked about yesterday, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. It will turn the fathers to the children. This is a prophecy of God. When, we are, when are men going to become fathers to the children? Uh, there's a reason why he says fathers here. There's a reason why men are supposed to rise up. And of course, uh, it's fought against by the devil in, in, in profound ways. You know, why are women put down? They're not put down. <laughs> women will never be put down. They will always uh, be talking more and giving their uh, husbands, if you will, they'll, they'll, they're going to help them. They're going to help them. Yes, one of the word, good words is yes, influence. They're going to influence them. They influence them for bad or good. Eve helped in the bad at the beginning. But there's so many women in the Bible that we can talk about that have helped their husbands or men to do good. Even David, uh, you know, when... He was with Abigail, and Abigail said, you know, you're going to blow the whole thing about being a king and all that kind of thing if you don't do what is right. Just don't go out and kill all those people. And he didn't, and she rescued him. This is just one story. But let's look at the next uh, paragraph. We must begin immediately <laughs> to become involved in the political process. If I ask, if I ask a hundred people in the church, 1981. If I ask how many people are involved in the political process in our church, they'd say that's not for us to do. Now this man says it's what we're supposed to do. In the beginning of the of the fight with the English, it was the church. In the beginning of the country, the revolution, it was the church. 
in the second great awakening uh, to get rid of um, to get, get rid of slavery. It was the church. So all the big issues, the church was behind. The church, the Christians, the dogma of Christianity. Now uh, we even have uh, churches, godly people, that will vote for abortion. They'll vote for vote for abortion. That's no different than in the time of the Israelites where they are sacrificing their babies to Baal. Abortion is sacrificing lives to the devil. God says be fruitful and multiply. He didn't say multiply only if it's going to have a quality life or it's the choice of the person. It's not the choice of the person. They made the choice a long time ago when they made the baby. They, that was a choice. And so here we have, we're not involved in the political process. And by the way, if I preach this in the church, I'll have a lot of people that will come against me. And I have all, all my, my time I've been in the church, whether it be in the, the, the denomination or whether it be in the fellowship or whether it be right here in our own church. People, you, you can't talk about politics in church. <laughs> That's all they did to start this country. And this is what uh, one of the leaders has said in the past, Dr. Marshall Foster now. <laughs> so we must get involved in the political process. We've got a few days left for this election. If we don't get involved, it'll be just another God saying, well, you're not involved. You're not going to be involved. You, know, you, you, you don't want to have conflict. So he says this, for there are issues that need to be confronted before our entire structure is destroyed, which, in fact, I think is just hanging by that spider web that Jonathan Edwards talked about. God will not long tolerate a nation that legally kills unborn child, calling it abortion. Okay, so I want you to put down right there at the very bottom of page 109, and draw a little line or whatever and put down, that was 1973. 1973. So we're, in this case, we are eight years, uh, um, uh, well, excuse me, not eight years. We are uh, 73 to 81 is, uh, is that eight years? Eight, 19 only, yeah. Eight years by, has, has transpired since Roe versus Wade was became law. And basically, uh, O'Hare, the mother that got the law started, um, <clears throat> or was he the she parent of schools? She was parent of schools. But the but the, that goes back to '64, and though that she got that involved, and all of these people that are right now they're prominent. For example, one of them is Bill Gates. He's one of the strongest um, men financially in the world. His parents were the uh, uh, president of. Uh, uh, Planned Parenthood uh, pro-abortion. We're humanists now. Okay, so let us not forget, turn the page over, let us not forget the godly way nation building presupposes as its foundation Christian character and intelligent self-governing Christians. This is the reason we are failing in our current attempt to set up republics in foreign lands. In other words, you can't set up something that doesn't have a foundation. It just, you can't put a name on something and then it just becomes that. It has to be actually working. And these are a few ideas, he says, practical uh, suggestions for action. And so he says, in our homes, everything starts in the home. Where you live, everything starts. This morning, it started, you got up, uh, and you came to church, uh, unless you've been working all night, hallelujah, like Glenn, hallelujah, but um, some have that job nowadays. We'll see what happens. But um, one of the things that in, in 1981 that was prominent was television. That's where they were getting all our news. And so here it says, our television sets must be shut off and time set aside for family devotions. <coughs> By the way, this is, a, um, uh, this is a way that we, and in the church at that time, we were very, very involved in politics at that time. And so we not got rid of our television sets and we had family devotions. 
Um, I were sa I'm sad to say that the church did not continue uh, basically in the next generation to doing the same thing that we started when we did because, you know some we lost. We lost. Nobody got elected. We, 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 and so it, that was a, a hard pill to swallow. We, it almost, it, well, it did. It, it divided the church. It divided the pastor and his wife. They uh, both left they, in sin and, and left, and then they stuck this other guy in there to do it for a little bit, and he's still doing it. That's me. And so we, we lost it. You know, they, it was, it was, we, we lost that uh, in it, and, and it was, people were tired of the politics and getting beat up on the streets. And so that was enough for us. But one thing that should have not happened, and in many cases didn't happen, and they continued it, we had family devotions. And America's Christian heritage was studied together with a family. We studied that in our school from that time on in our history classes that uh, about God in our, our school. And, and many people have gone along and they have developed uh, wonderfully in their own lives. But again, still, we have to provide the proper example. You should underline that because it says that when, in the first part of the uh, paragraph, it says family devotions where America's Christian heritage can be studied together as a family. We even have a home group at the uh, Caesar home, uh, which Mrs. Uh, Caesar uh, is uh, Miss America most of the time, all the time, and, and she uh, decides that we're going to have holidays and celebrate those holidays, and almost every single holiday we have has something to do uh, with God, if the family, devotions, uh, America. They're all uh, wonderful opportunities. Now, a lot of them get uh, sliced and diced by the humanists, but they and, and they become barbecues and different things. But mo most all of them, uh, if not all, have some Christian uh, association. So, we, going on in that paragraph is we must provide a proper example, and we're at that state right now where we can really rise up and do something for. Um, our political pr uh, process that we're going through. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to take this time for America's freedom history, that we get involved in the political process in such a way that we were taught in the early days to be involved, to look at the, uh, the candidates, to look at the uh, laws that are being passed and how they, re how the Bible, how God would vote and tell us to vote. That should be significant. But you understand that, that, you know, we get all these sayings, oh, both parties are the same. They're not the same. They both have platforms. And typically, we look too much at the person. Look at the platform of the party. That's the point. I mean, uh, you could go for the Green Party or the Independent Party or, you know, whatever party you want, but make sure that that party uh, is expressing God's will in, in the major form. I'm, I'm sorry that uh, you might think it's uh, not uh, appropriate for just one issue, but the one issue is the Declaration of Independence, what we have an alien or a right to life. If you don't have that, if you don't have an inalienable right given to you by God for life, everything else goes to naught. It's like, the, it's like the Bible. If you don't believe the first verse, what's the rest of it good for? It's just then like writings. It's just like, you know, just a, a story, that nice story, and maybe some people, and that's the way they want us to believe. But it, it says these words, in the beginning, God. God. If you don't believe in God and the God of that book, then don't read the rest of the book because it's not going to work. God is the one. And God says, take dominion over the earth. And he says, be fruitful and multiply. He can do so much as far as even taking care of the planet God takes care of the planet. We don't. Anyway, we try, but we don't. We try. 
So here we have it, that our desperate need is to be what God has called us to be in our homes, in our families, in our church family, in our schools, teaching our children. And, and there, there, right off the bat, you take that Malachi chapter 4, it says, in that time when God turns the hearts of the fathers to the children, that is when there's going to be that out pouring of God's spirit upon the nations. And this is one of the reasons. I mean, I can't think of a better uh, statement uh, for my own, in my own life is that I was challenged by the fact in 19, uh, even in the 70s with Marshall Foster, I was challenged to the fact that men need to be spiritual. You know, my father was a spiritual man, but my mom was, more, it was even stronger. You know, I, my father was a doctor, and so he, he, he was trying to heal people. You know, he says, I can't heal anybody. Only God can do that. But I'm just helping. You know, I'm just doing what God tells me. But in his relationship with his, his uh, children, myself, my older brother, my younger brother, and my sister, his, um, his was more like a, a, a rule. Of course, that had a lot to do with his father. But that was a generation that fought a war, and they didn't want to talk about the war, and they didn't want to talk about the death and destruction and everything, and, that, and that's what, what was happening. They don't, nobody wanted to go to, through another war after World War II. But the point is, is the fathers didn't become spiritual. They didn't take the throne. They didn't take God that serious. They allowed the, uh, the women to come in, and I'm not against the women. I'm telling you, but I'm just saying that's what the Bible says. When the men decide, when the fathers are when hearts turn to the children, that's when God's revivals. And so I saw that in the fellowship ministry led by Wayman Mitchell. And he says, we're going to have men be spiritual. And these are hippies. These hippies, hippies that are smoking pot and get, having sex and doing all this thing. And, you know, and Playboy magazine comes out and all this stuff. He says, no, you're going to put that away. And you're going to be a man of God, and you're going to preach the gospel, and you're going to teach people that God is alive, and he wants to save our nation. And that, that's really what, uh, what the fellowship's all about. So, <clears throat> look at the, uh, the uh, statement here. It says, we must be proper examples, and then drop down to our personal study. And if, I, if I, I could, you can just put a colon there and say Lighthouse University. That's our personal study is at, like, this is it. You're doing it right now. And you can see how many people are here. I don't know how many are on the uh, live stream, but it gets less and less all the time. Why? Because this is not something people want to do. People do not want to uh, have personal time with God. They'll tell you they do, but they don't do it. They'll, uh, they'll say, okay, uh, I'm going to read the Bible, but, you know, the, the Internet, all of a sudden something pops up. Boy, that's important. I got a, I got a message or I got a, a notification or if I got to go to Facebook or I got to go to Bookface. <laughs> so our personal study, we have unfortunately grown up in a generation that emphasize, emphasize specialization. Many of us have developed, and I underline this next quotation, Leave it to the experts mentality. Leave it to the scientists. Let me tell you something. Scientists, scientists do not know what they're talking about. Necessarily, they're trying to find answers. And the science of things doesn't always work out. You know, when we started flying airplanes, it wasn't working very well. Lots of people got killed. That's just a, a, the, the science of flight. They're learning about it, but they don't know all the answers. We had a situation in our church here, a woman that had um, contracted cancer. And the doctors told me, they said, you know, she's going to be okay. Everything, we've seen this cancer before. We're going to be able to treat it, blah, 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 blah. The problem was they didn't know it, and there was a 3% chance that that could have been a genetic problem, but they didn't check the genetic problem, and the science killed her because they didn't treat that part of it. 
They didn't understand it. And it got so far along, they couldn't treat it, and she died. And uh, I can't go through the whole thing, but I can tell you this right now. I talked to about three or four doctors, and I said, well, why, you know, what, what's, don't worry. You can go and assure her that, that she, she's going to, this cancer can be, there's very little chance that she's not going to live. Well, she died in three months. And uh, that's just in the medical field. But there's so many fields of science, whether it comes to the climate, are you kidding me? You know, these people think they know what they're doing. It's science. It's not, they can't fix it. They don't know how to do it. And they're called scientists. Well, science, science some, a lot of time, is a failure. So leave it to the experts, bad, bad news. For many of the experts have killed people. And they're killing people all the time when it comes to abortion. This attitude must change if we are to restore self-governing republic. You see, I'm just going to go talk to the expert and let him do it. No, you've got to find out what God's saying yourself and take responsibility. We would encourage you to continue your study in the Christian history. Begin by mastering the study guide and the companion volumes. We, we, <laughs> we didn't even read the first book, which is only about 70 or 80 pages. I don't know. No, it's 120 pages or something. 120. We're on 110. 120 pages. We didn't read that one even. And then we go to the ones that are 400 and, you know, all these men and women that have given us examples in the past, laid down their lives. How many of, how many of us are willing to say, give me liberty or give me death today? Honestly, give me liberty. For liberty, give me liberty because I'm going to stand for the United States of America. And you're saying, no way. I'm not going to stand for a country that doesn't even believe in the country. And so this is why we're where we're at. And he, our libraries are out of balance, he writes here. He says, uh, then uh, he's, in his last sentence, uh, he says, uh, we encourage you to continue your study of Christian history. Begin by mastering the study guide and the companion volumes. Then obtain others, such as mentioned in the reading list in the guide, to build your library on Christian self-government. Our libraries are out of balance. Many of us have devotional libraries. What he's saying is feel-good libraries. It's all about feelings today. But few have books necessary to apply God's principles to government, economics, education, law, etc. Only, only through increasing our knowledge in this way can we learn to exercise godly dominion. And by the way, this was written in 1981. Again, I say this. We will continue. And I'm not beating up anybody that's listening because you are, the, you are the ones that are doing it. You are the ones that are taking it. But just think about it. What part of our life does this really make up? How do we even get involved in it? In, in, involved in the political process. Involved in the, the process of being a man of God and a woman of God. Let me tell you something, it does not say in Malachi 4, when the hearts of the mothers turn to the children, it does not say that. It says when the hearts of the fathers turn to the children, I'm coming and I'm going to bring revival. Listen, fathers, listen, men, there's no identity crisis here. There's just a lack of devotion to God. And the longer men run from the responsibility, the more that God will pour out the vengeance against it. We must rise up and we must love the children. And the basic, <laughs> the basic children is babies. If you don't love the babies, then it's just gonna continue or oh, that life was not intended, all kinds of garbage that's been put through. And by the way, just look at the prisons. The prisons are made up of no fathers, no fathers. God bless you, and we'll continue. We're going to continue to look at the sphere of uh, the home and the church and how they work together. Uh, but we also are going to make a great uh, emphasis on the political aspect of being a Christian here at Lighthouse University. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.